I sent up my records. I have records of all these companies. I've visited over 3,000 companies over the years when I had my own company working all these classified experiments anywhere. Sometimes I could be at the Lockheed Skunk Works. We'd be looking at putting strain gauges on a wing of some supersonic airplane that's going in a wind tunnel, or I could be, we were, I remember doing some chirogenic work at a place up in Fullerton, Ogden Labs, just places all over that I, w that I went to. So I had all this, I have all these names and all these companies and all their projects all listed. I kept, I was smart enough to keep all the records. I still have them today in a, in a vault. So I took copies of them to the Senate to uh, put before a subcommittee so we could do some sort of uh, work. They wanted some kind of credibility about my background. I thought that was plenty enough. And we were making progress towards maybe getting this, something pushed through where we could actually get the Freedom of Information Act redone a little bit and get some real freedom of information out there rather than a bunch of reports that you get now with everything X'd out that's interesting with somebody's marker pen. So you end up with a bunch of spots on a piece of paper that's supposedly classified, declassified information. Not. So anyway, we're right in the middle of this, and all of a sudden, guess what? 9-11 hit. So all of the stuff that we were working on became secondary information. And, of course, the terrorist thing and all the things we're dealing with now became came to light. So we now, once again, have the extraterrestrial situation put on a back shelf where it remains today, unfortunately. It's arranged today, but we are going to bring it forward anyway. We're not going to wait anymore for the government because they're going to drag their feet and create all kinds of side effect events to waylay the true information coming to the American public. And it was interesting because recently Brazil has decided the, the government down there to release this information. And one of the, about the best thing that they were able to release in their information to the world was the fact that the United States government is covering up and putting pressure on all the other governments to keep covered up the true situation. So that's what really came out. As far as information, statistical and factual information on events themselves, they didn't come out. Just to, just to notice that, yeah, the U.S. doesn't want anything out. So now we know that. Yes, that's new information, maybe. Who knows? I turn around. I sound. She carries her name.
just thought you might need to hear that right in the middle of all this because that brings us up into the next phase of where we're going with all the things that we're talking about. That is a little bit further down into the fellowship, but that last sound you heard was a Pleiadian ship. They do exist, and that was a real one, actually dutifully recorded. And that brings me up to the point in this little sojourn into the hello land of all the people out there listening now, where we get into the phase of my extraterrestrial contacts and how they all started. Well, they were always on the back of my mind, I suppose, really starting to kick in pretty much uh, way before what we were just talking about, probably at the latter part of NASA. And when I sold my electronics company and let it go by the wayside, it was time now to do something different. So I took some time off and began to study with a different Himalayan master. I was pretty much fed up with the government lifestyle that I lived most of my life up to this point. I hadn't had much of a personal life, that's for sure. I looked more inside of laboratories than I did the sun, so I needed to like have a big change in my life. And so that was the beginning of it. So I began to learn about meditation and studying and do all the kinds of things that we necessarily need to do. We don't take the time. We don't take the time actually to do these kinds of things. So I began to do the meditation and the yoga and the breathing, and I went and became a vegetarian and studied with these Tibetan masters and for many years and. A whole change in consciousness came about, and I thought maybe I would never go back to the scientific world. Ha ha! What I'm back into now again. But at that point, I had no had no more use for it in my life. I thought so. In the process of teaching Kundalini Yoga and learning Kundalini Yoga and all these different things, I began to learn that the human mind was very powerful. I learned things like energy follows thought careful what you think and I also learned that the mind is the slayer of the real what your daily thoughts are typically aren't real you're just you're just coping with what your existence is at that point in time and don't take it seriously those are the kinds of lessons I was learning well in the process of going through that learning process I began to get impressions in my mind of something else coming from somewhere else uh, not like a madman uh, experiencing voices after too much drink or drug but something that was actually there that was a part of me but it wasn't and so I began to put meditation classes together so that I could teach of the possibility of an extraterrestrial contact and how that might be theoretically because remember the scientist part of me was still there if it were to happen well it did happen in 1971 in Laguna Beach California up on Nestal Road strangely enough where Several years previous to that, a guy that, by the name of George Ademsky that also lived in that same street and had similar experiences. I had an experience at 3 o'clock in the morning when an extraterrestrial ship came down over my house on Nestal Road. And Nestal, Laguna Beach in those days was very, very sparsely populated. And we were on the edge of a cliff. And so I looked out over the cliff. And hovering behind the cliff was this big, huge spaceship with this girl in it. And I had my first encounter with a woman from the Pleiades known as Samyasi. And I don't know if it was the best encounter you could ask for, but it was definitely an encounter because somehow or other I'd been thinking about her too much and my meditation group had been thinking about the possibility of this contact a little too much and it kind of prematurely brought them over to meet with us uh, and kind of their message was to slow down with what you're doing. We'll come to you when the time is right. And I remember that the dogs were 3 o'clock in the morning and the dogs were barking everywhere, even though there weren't that many houses. I don't know where the dogs came from. And she pointed, standing in her ship, hovering, telepathically talking to me, uh, saying, see how loud the dogs are? This is all wrong. This, we shouldn't be having this meeting at this time. You've kind of brought us on a little fast. And I guess being a triple Leo, I have a lot of mental energy that's out of control most of the time. And this being a case in point. So I dealt with it and they left and I scratched my head and wondered well this is very interesting my life has definitely made a turn in the unknown now and I do remember of course over the over time the how the contacts began was that besides that one I mean it was kind of like uh, I had this kind of a sensual feeling in my body and then I would uh, see the hair on my arms kind of raise and then I would hear a separate voice a soft voice in my head and that was of course with Samyasi because a lot of people ask me 
uh, what was it like? How did you make contact? Was it, what is a telepathic contact? Well, it's, to me, it was a feeling at first, and once that feeling was pretty much apparent and wasn't going to go away, regardless of the uh, environment that I was in, and then then I knew the voice would be following soon. And it took me a long time to many many years.